Please come. The conference about commandos robots is going to start. So Rimby nearly did the job already. <laughs> so we have the chance today to welcome Ricardo Tellas. Uh, please. <laughs> So Ricardo Teles is working for PAL Robotics since 2007. Yes. Uh, and he is also simultaneously finishing his PhD at the Technical University of Catalonia in Barcelona. Uh, today he will talk to us about WIMB and WIMH here. So Ricardo, please. Thank you. So, I would like to introduce you, Vim B. Hi everybody, are you enjoying the campus party? Okay, and uh, would you like to talk about something? I'm going to talk about vertical garden. Okay, no, that was the previous speech. So, would you like to talk about humanoids, for instance? No. I'm going to sit down because I'm really tired. Okay, okay, so I'll bring your chair. Okay, you can do it. Okay. Yeah. Now you can try. Okay, very good. So, what good? Thanks, mate. You can follow with your presentation now. Okay, thank you, Rim. So, hello, everybody. My name is Ricardo Teller. I work for a company called Par Robotics, and I develop humanoid robots. You know, when I tell this to some people, the first question that they ask me is, would it be nice to construct a humanoid robot for ironing clothes? And then the next question is, but would it be nice to construct a humanoid robot for having sex? And then, yeah, I, okay, I say, okay, that would be nice, but unfortunately, we don't have yet those kinds of very nice humanoid robots that we see on movies. And uh, in the movies, what we see are humanoid robots that are very intelligent, they share the space with us, but unfortunately, we have not arrived to this situation yet. So the question is then, why don't we have those kinds of nice humanoid robots yet? Well, I can devise at least three main reasons. Let me show you them here. First, we actually don't know how a humanoid robot should work. And even if we know something about a humanoid robot should work, we have to face then a second problem, that is that we don't know how to build a humanoid robot. And in some cases, even if we achieve to build some of those humanoid robots, we have another problem, is that we don't know how to sell them. Around this talk, you will see that we have some answers to those questions, but we don't have a complete solution yet. And that is good, because otherwise I wouldn't have that job. So let's talk about how humanoid robots should work. Well, in order to have a humanoid robot like those ones here, you have to have a lot of different systems that work all together. For instance, you need a movement system, like the legs or the wheels, that allow the robot to move. Then you also need a manipulation system, arms with hands, that allow the robot to grasp things. You also need a, kind, a different kind of sensors that allow the robot to perceive the environment. 
Additionally, you need a navigation system. That is the one that allows the robot to move from one place to another while avoiding obstacles. If the humanoid has to be complete, it also needs a human-robot interaction system in order to be able to interact the robot with people. And finally, we find the brain, what we can call brain. That is the system that coordinates all the other systems and generates the robot behavior. OK, so the problem is that we actually don't know how all those systems should work. We have just small ideas. I'll give you some examples. For instance, for the walking mechanism, current humanoid robots, they use electrical motors to generate or emulate human joints, human joints here. The problem of using electrical motors is that they are very inefficient, and they also can carry very, very small weight. Other approaches have tried to use pneumatic motors, like in the picture, or even hydraulic motors. But they also have a lot of problems, like having to carry an air compressor or having a very low, low precision. Then, if you build a humanoid robot with these kinds of uh, systems, with these kinds of motors, then you have a robot that can fall down even if there is a small disturbance, perturbance on the ground. And that's not good. Maybe you just push a little bit the robot, and then it will fall down. At present, there are some new research on using hydraulic motors. And there has been a company in America that has just released a new kind of walking mechanism based on hydraulic motors, like here. You can see. And then in this case, the robot can accept pushes from the outside, and the robot doesn't fall down and uh, can recover its trajectory. However, this is yet uh, very, in very early stages. So we need a lot of time to use this on real robots. For the manipulation system, another example. The manipulation system is based on the arms and on the hands. For use this, we inherit from the typical manipulation systems used in car factories. But in humanoid robots, it's a lot more difficult because you have to fit the motors on the physical structure of the robot. And this is very small. What happens by putting small motors on a physical structure of the robot is that you have a very, very low strength. You can notice this especially when you try to the robot because the fingers, you want the fingers to be very small. Then you have to put very small motors inside. So the robot can of the robot. And this implies that the robot has to understand what is sensing. That is a very, very big problem that we have. The sensory system of the robot is based on different types of sensors. For instance, I'll show you here some uh, stereo camera, a sonar uh, range sensor, or a laser sensor, uh, range sensor. So OK, you can use this to perceive the environment. But the real, real problem is to make the robot understand what it's sensing. And make a robot understand something is one of the biggest problems that artificial intelligence is facing. It's the system that allows the robot to make a plan for moving from one place to another and avoid the obstacles that it finds in the middle, in the pathway. These systems are work quite well at present, but only on labor laboratories. When you put those systems on a real, uh, in a real humanoid robot, and you put that humanoid robot on a real environment, like this place, or a museum, then the environment starts to be cluttered of, uh, full of people, things that change place, and the navigation system becomes uh, confused. So for navigation systems, they work correctly on laboratories, but not so correctly when you put on a real environment. And with the interaction system, it happens something similar. 
The interaction system is the one that allows the robot to interact with people. For instance, it can have a speech recognizer system, a face recognizer system, and also a speech synthesizer system. And in some more complex robots, the human interaction interface also contains that and can express the emotions of the robot. But this is for more very complex robots, human robots. So what happens with the interaction system is that the speech recognizer, for instance, works very well on the laboratory, but not so well when you put on a real environment because you have a lot of noise of the environment. The same happens with the face recognition system. It can recognize a face in very, very nice light condition, but if you change the light conditions, the robot can fail to recognize the, the, the person. Just to give you an example, some, some months ago, we brought RIMB for a fair to the United States. And then we were making their public demonstrations of the robot and making recognize the face of people. So there was a black guy there that wanted to be recognized. And then he came there, he put in front of the robot, and then says the robot started to recognize his face. So he tried, he tried, and he tried. And after one minute of trying to recognize his face, the robot says something like this. The left side of your face is too dark. I can't recognize you. Of course, his side was dark because he was black. And we were very lucky that he didn't lose sweeters. So this is just to give you an example of the current situation of those uh, recognition systems. For the coordination system, the brain, what can we expect? Well, not too much yet. Basically, the brains are coordinating the behavior in a kind of table that encodes everything that the robot is doing in these situations. So it has a table that says, if you are in this situation, then do this. If you are in this situation, then do this other thing. OK, so the problem is that you cannot code with, within this table all the options, that the, all the situations that the robot will face on a real life. So it's not uh, completely solved this problem yet, neither. So imagine that we use all this small knowledge that we have about how one robot should work, and we try to build one. So now let's talk about the problems that we face when we try to build one humanoid robot. Well, in order to build a humanoid robot, we have to face, I think, three problems more. First, we have to physically construct the robot, the structure that supports the robot. Then we have to construct the electronics that go inside this physical structure. And then we have to construct the software that controls these electronics and mechanics. So let me give you an example. If you want to construct your humanoid robot, you want to construct a leg, for instance, you cannot go to the shop and then say, OK, just give me a pair of legs for my robot. No, it doesn't work like this yet. So you have to start by building the physical structure of the legs, then building the electronics that go inside, and then building the software that will control these legs. As you can imagine, this is a huge amount of work. And imagine how big is this amount of work if you multiply this for all the systems of the humanoid robot. That's a lot of work. And also, this approach is very expensive and limiting, limiting in time and in the kind of things that we can implement. That is why I think that at present, humanoid building is something like an artisan work. And uh, however, there are some movements at present in the world that are trying to change this situation. And these movements are in the direction of creating standards, both standards in hardware and in software. In terms of 
standards of hardware, let me explain you what I mean by this. Some companies, like for example, our company, we are building some complete joint modules. That means that they are standard modules that you can use on any part of your robot. For instance, the joint module contains the physical structure, the electronics, and the control software to create a joint of the robot. In fact, the arms of this robot here have been constructed by using those modules. Then you just to have to buy three of those modules, and then you have the arm. One, two, and three. That's it. And that's an example of the type of standards that we are trying to, to generate in hardware. In software, there are also a lot of different projects that try to build standard software that will work on different types of sensors and uh, motors, actuators, whatever. So imagine that we use all those tools that we have here, and we achieve to build a humanoid robot. OK, we have achieved that. Now we have to face another different problem. So how do we sell those humanoid robots? And here again, we face three more problems. One is that we have to have a very well-defined task for the robot. So the robot has to know what it has to do in a very precise way. Precise way. Then the robot has to do this task in a very robust way. I mean that the robot has, cannot fail on doing this task. And finally, we find another problem that is how to find the price worth to be paid for this humanoid robot. So for the, uh, finding the application that the, for the robot that we have already constructed, this is difficult. Yes, it would be nice to have a humanoid robot for hiding the robots, and even better for having sex. But our current humanoid robots, they don't uh, have the abilities yet to do that. So a present humanoid robots, as you can see if you attend to or stand, they can just barely move around, then recognize some sentences, recognize some people, and barely interact with people in a simple way. So, what kind of applications we can find for this robot? Basically, simple ones like being a museum guy, attracting people to your stand, making publicity, or acting as an information point. The problem with these applications is that they don't produce enough money for a company, to, because a company is very complex. We need to produce more money in order to stay alive. Hence, I would like to, to tell you that we are open to receive any suggestion of application for the robot. So if you have any suggestion, please, please let us know. Then we have the problem also that the robot has to perform this task in a very robust way. Some months ago, we hired a businessman in our company to run the selling part of our company. I wanted to tease him every day, asking him, hey, how many robots have you already sold? And he was always answering me, hey, how many working robots have you already built? And you know, he was right. We cannot sell a robot that falls down when there is a little disturbance on the ground. We cannot sell a humanoid robot that cannot recognize a face if the lighting conditions have changed from the previous room. So we need to achieve that the robot perform its task in a very robust way. That's what I mean by having a robust implementation of a task. In this case, yes, these are some of our experiments that they are not robust, trying to kick the, the, the ball. Well, finally, we find the problem of the price. So what would be a price to pay for these kinds of humanoid robots? Well, humanoid robots are very, very expensive. Just to make you an idea of how expensive they are, 
I'll give you a comparison with other robots' prices. For instance, in this case, we have the Ibo robot. It's a dog-style robot. And its price is about 2,000 euros. Quite an amount, I would say. So if we change a humanoid robot that is called now, it's a humanoid robot this size, more or less, yeah, a small humanoid robot. The price goes to 13,000, about there. So what do you think that would be the price of this humanoid robot? It's H HRP2. It's a humanoid robot, human size, this size. How much do you think? Well, I will not tell you. I will leave you for you to figure it out by yourself. But I can give you a clue that is several hundred thousand. So robots, humanoid robots particularly, are very expensive. And why is so? Well, I think that the two main reasons are because building a humanoid robot at present is like an artisan work. And also because the materials that we are using on those robots are very expensive because they are very special materials that not, there, there is not a big market for these materials. Fortunately, prices are rising down in the pre at present, and then I, I, I think that they will raise even more in the near future. So we'll see. Just to finish with my talk, I would like to talk to you about the future of humanoid robots. It is expected that the whole robotic market is about to explode in the near future. However, for humanoid robots, it will take a longer time than expected. So I don't think that in the near future we'll have an explosion of human selling humanoid robots. And also, the humanoid robots that we'll have in the near future will be a simplified version of the ones that we see on films. For instance, I see those robots in the humanoid robots of the near future, something like this, like in the picture, or the one that you can see here, Dream H1. Those robots have changed the legs by wheels. And also they have changed the speech interface from using the speech to using a touch screen where you can command the robot to do the things that you want. Also, the applications for those robots will be very simple, as I have studied already, like museum guides, or attracting people to your stands, or acting as an information point. So, just to conclude, let me show you some examples of already made humanoid robots on the, that work in the same way as Remage. For instance, this is the Fujitsu robot. We have also the Ropi service robot and uh, also the Kerobot and the SmartPal. These are already built humanoid robots that you can buy if you want. OK, the summary of my talk is this. The question was, why don't we have yet humanoid robots, like in the films? So these are the reasons for me. They perform at present very simple tasks. And they perform those tasks in a very non-robust way. Finally, the, the, final, um, the final reason is that they are very expensive. And that concludes my talk. So if you have any question, then I will be happy to, to answer. And if you want to come and visit us in our stand, it's on the other building there. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Okay. So questions? <laughs> the first question that comes to my mind is why do we want humanoid robots? Why do we want this form factor uh -huh. if it's so complex to build? Uh, what's the real motivation behind that? And a second question, what's the wait, revenue wait, wait. stream one, for... One, one at a time. <laughs> okay. Then after that, You're not a robot, excuse yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> one at a time. So, yeah, this is a very typical question. And... Uh, in fact, there are, I, I can say that there are two ways of thinking about that. There are some people that work in robotics industry that they think that we have to build robots that 
perform a single task very well performed, very robust. And for this, they don't need to have a humanoid, uh, way, uh, a humanoid form, uh, shape, sorry. And then there is another uh, way of thinking about that, that is, okay, we would like to have a robot that performs different tasks, different. And we don't want to change the environment to put this robot into that. So we want the robot to just use the same tools, the same environments that we are using. And for this, we think that the best shape, in order to be so universal for different places, is to have a humanoid shape. Then also I can tell you my opinion, my personal opinion, is that making this kind of robot is a lot more fun. So that's, in my, in my case, is because it's a lot of fun doing this. But those are the two uh, reasons uh, that people usually say. And the second question? Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering uh, what's the revenue stream for a company like yours today? Because the what? The Sorry. The re revenues. Oh. Uh, because the market is very small if it exists. So how does your company survive today? Yeah. Yeah. So at present, uh, we are building our first commercial version of our robot. That is the one that I showed you on the, on the pictures there. At, and until then, we are doing just research. So we have some investors that help us and invest on all research in order to be able to, to, to reach the development of this robot. And uh, well, also uh, with those robots, we can do some uh, uh, exhibitions. We bring the robots to exhibitions, to stands, to places to attract people and then uh, you can get some revenue for that. So question. Have you seen a mage? Uh -huh. It's moving around, looking uh -huh. for female robots. I was, I was just wondering, because in Japan, they've got this amazing robot who can dance, who can sing, and I was just wondering why in Europe we are not doing more like funny kind of task robots. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Is this robot can dance, for example? Yeah. Can you sing or? Yeah, we can dance a little bit. Yes, I will show you later then that he can dance a little bit. It's not very sensual dance, but you can call it like a dance. And the thing, uh, uh, well, you know, it's so difficult to build a humanoid robot. It requires uh, so much energy and time from us, the engineers that we work on that, that. You just spend all your time by trying to create just this, a robot that does like this, just simple things like this. And you don't have time to make the robot do some funny things, you know? Also because we are engineers and then we are yeah, but thinking about it. How do you explain that the Japanese have the time to do so? Yeah, well, the Japanese, they work even more than us. You know, they are just crazy about work. So. Maybe that's the reason why they have. And also, uh, they, have some, they are some years ahead of us. Maybe they have already, some years ago, they were on the stage that we are now in some, for some particular robots, okay? And then now we can use this time ahead to develop these kind of more funny things that you, you would like to see. Thank you. Other questions? First, I would have a comment. So I think that the price of the robot, it's, uh, uh, it's a question, but it's not so big question because it may happen as it happened with mobile phones. If the robot would be useful, then the mass production will cause the... Yes. Uh, so the problem it is that the robot are not useful, are useless. Yes. So, and the main reason is cognition. It's so my question, do you see the light at the end of the tunnel? regarding this cognition or not at all? Because now the robots are not even as intelligent as, for example, bees uh, or cockroach. They don't like understand yes. what they are doing. Yes, yes, of course. I work on artificial intelligence, so I think that we'll reach this place where robots will be very intelligent, like in the films. But it will take a lot of time. It will take, and related to the price, 
I completely agree with you. The first problem is making the robot perform a task. That's why I put on the list that the price as the, the bottom reason for that. No? But the, the first one is exactly what you say. The robot has to perform a task. And it has to do it very, very correctly. It cannot fail. Because otherwise, the people will not, be, will not want to pay the price. Even if it is high or low, they will not want to pay this money for a, a something that is useless. So completely agree. Another question? Um, <clears throat> do you think that, um, so obviously humanoid robots are quite kind of rare and, you know, yeah. fascinating at the moment, mm -hmm. but then um, uh, potentially, you know, are we in a kind of, a self-defeating thing, like the you know, as they become more commonplace, then they become less interesting uh -huh. to you know for yes. us. And then the kind of the you know, because I would say that the, we're trying to make humanoid robots because they're yeah yeah like, you cannot like see you, them in other so places fun and they're so fascinating. Yes. But then when we you know, if we kind of make them all, they become more commonplace. Well, then you know we might uh, decide that you know, the kind of human form factor isn't, you know, it seems to me that it's, it's clearly not the, the best way of kind of doing stuff around the home. You know, you could have lots of tiny robots all in your kitchen or whatever. Yeah. Or, you yeah. Know, or in, just fact, in fact, Bill Gates wrote a paper about uh, the future of, of robots in general. And he was devising this kind of situation that you said, that where there is a house where there are a lot of different robots as you also say, you were commenting, is, and each robot was specialized in one task. Was there was a robot that was um, cleaning the swimming pool. There was another one that was cleaning the floor inside the house, another making surveillance, another just um, cleaning the, the clothes. That's it. And uh, related to the shape of the humanoid robot, why people is attracted to this? OK, I don't know. But I can tell you, the company that has built the now robot, you know the now robot, the, human, the small humanoid robot I showed you before? So this company, before attempting to construct this humanoid robot, they make uh, research on people about what were the preferences uh, for the shape of a robot, of any shape. It has not to be humanoid. And there was a big difference the results shown that there was a big difference between the people that wanted to have a humanoid robot, a human shape, and the people that didn't care about this shape. So I don't know why, but we are attracted for that. Mm. Another one? <coughs> Do you think that uh, in the next year, a uh, humanoid robot can target to do something in the dangerous environment? like in the case of fire or other? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. The problem is that these environments are very, very, very complex. Very complex. There is a, a kind of robotic competition that you probably know. It's called RoboCup. In the RoboCup, there is a section for rescue robots. And the press, they, so the best rescue robots are brought there to test their abilities there. And uh, at present, uh, all of them are telecommanded, remotely commanded. I mean, uh, having a robot uh, autonomously moving on a rescue place where there has been a disaster is very, very difficult. I don't know. It's, it's a very big problem. If we already have problems having a robot moving here, imagine if there is a disaster here with everything pulled down, lots of people there. That, so I think that it will take a long time. But uh, maybe in this case, the, the, expensive, the, sp the sp robot expensive is not a problem because yes. uh, it's more important that uh, to, save life. to save life. Yes, but in this case, the robot has to perform the task correctly. Uh, it cannot fail. It say, okay, I cannot go in this way because it's very, it's very dark. Yeah. I don't know. So, yes, I agree. <laughs> 